Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, Go Seeker and Serene Risk for inviting uh, me, a sociologist, of course, not a cybersecurity uh, expert or practitioner. Um, so these are some of the results of a postdoctoral uh, research uh, currently undergoing. Um, and today, of course, as you know, I'm going to talk about cyber insurance. And the question I want to ask is, will cyber insurance improve cybersecurity? And so research has suggested that um, insurers act as de facto regulators of organizations uh, privacy uh, law compliance, and that, of course, it would perhaps uh, lead to improving uh, cybersecurity hygiene and best practices. Uh, what is interesting here is that a lot of this, this last claim has been uh, proposed by the insurance industry itself. So do insurers lead to improving cybersecurity? And in other words, can we think of private insurance as a cybersecurity uh, public policy tools, right? A way for government to kind of, and, 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 and firms to, to outsource and delegate cybersecurity. The way I'm approaching uh, the, the question is through an um, analysis of market construction. So for me, markets are not natural. They, they do not uh, emerge spontaneously. They have to be built in a lot of different ways. And of course, for me, um, public policy is central to market construction. So there's no way we could we can conceive of the economy and as politics as being disconnected. And so what I'm looking at here is um, what I call what, what, what we call gray literature. So insiders' opinion, uh, reports, uh, data produced by uh, rating agencies by insurers themselves, by reinsurers, uh, or, or uh, international organizations like uh, the OECD, IMF, etc., and also by cybersecurity um, uh, researchers. And so in other words, I want to look at both the perspective of insurers and of outsiders in um, how they see the impact of private insurance on cybersecurity. So first, I'm going to talk about the US market. So briefly describing the US market. Secondly, I'm gonna talk about benefits and the limits of private cybersecurity in terms, uh, sorry, private uh, cyber insurance in terms of cybersecurity. And finally, I'm gonna talk about big issue here, the elephant in the room, catastrophic and systemic, uh, systemic risks and how they are uh, connected to the cyber insurance market. So the cyber insurance market is a relatively small market, but it is growing very fast. Uh, we're talking about 37% growth uh, from 2006 to 2007. And interestingly, the US is still by far the global center uh, for private insurance, uh, along with some underwriters in London and, and, and Bermuda. Uh, and so, Again, interesting, interestingly, Lloyd's of London is the single largest underwriter of cyber risks in the US with around 27% of the of, uh, market shares. And you can see only the top three here with AIG and Excel Group being um, accounting for around 48% of the market. And we can also see uh, very far on your right uh, Berkshire Hathaway, so we've got our friend Warren Buffett having his position in the market. So, uh, quite a concentrated market, um, and uh, also concentrated in a way that uh, some US risks are being underwritten in London. So, short history. Cyber insurance uh, originated in the 1990s, of course, out of personal privacy regulations, uh, in terms of personal health information and personal financial information. Uh, so a couple of uh, important uh, bills were passed in the uh, second half of the 1990s in the US, whereas this regulation created insurable costs, right? So 
So this is how private insurers first kind of be, uh, been interested in cyber risk, right? Not in cyber risk per se, but in cyber liability risk. So at first, the market is a cyber liability market. At, uh, then, in the early 2000s, with mandatory breach notification laws, the market started to move uh, towards cyber risks, broadly speaking. Um, I'll be discussing about this uh, just after uh, this slide. Um, and so, non-liability liability cost started being covered by private insurers. And very importantly, mandatory disclosure provides an incentive for insured organization to actually seek payouts, right? Despite reputational uh, risks. And so, for me, these two types of, of laws, of, of pieces of legislation, have been kind of foundational to um, the cyber insurance market. And so again, at first, the market was um, moving around mostly third-party coverage, right? This, this idea of cyber liability risk. Um, and then only later on, uh, insurers started covering first-party coverages for, um, for organizations owning ITC and other technologies, cyber technologies. And so you see that from a, a, a liability kind of um, uh, based market, we moved uh, more and more towards stuff like extortion, ransom, business interruption, and even more recently towards property and material damages. So we see this kind of move in the market from third party to uh, first party uh, coverage. When cyber insurance emerged in the 1990s, it was first as a product, meaning that cyber liability coverage was sold as a standalone policy, as a policy of, of, of its own, right? Whereas in the early 2000s, the market moved to uh, 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 covering cyber as a peril, as one risk, as one risk included in package commercial policies. So we see a little bit the evolution of the market here, and especially of coverage. And so there's no doubt that insurers can be uh, considered as breach coaches for insured organization, right? Because they provide legal and cyber security services that uh, some businesses, some organizations cannot provide in-house. Another benefit, perhaps the, the biggest for me, um, is for SMEs, right? Less resources, less expertise, and so they gain not only financial protection, this is what insurance is, but also uh, they are able to outsource some legal and some cybersecurity uh, services. And finally, what about this, this claim that cyber insurance would improve uh, will improve and does improve um, cyber hygiene, cyber hygiene and best practices. So before we dwell into this, let's think about a bit fire insurance. So okay, we could go on uh, for a long time um, on, on the history of fire insurance. For instance, in the uh, early uh, 17th century in, in, in England, insurers were very kind of uh, depressed and, and desperate about trying to, uh, uh, to solve the, the recurring uh, fires in London. But first thing they did was to establish private firefighting brigades. Quickly, they found out that these private firefighting brigades were not uh, efficient, right? Because they were mostly being used to save uh, the richest uh, property owners' uh, property, right? And so quickly, I would say, uh, not quickly, around 100 years after that, firefighters, firefighting was being implemented by, of course, government, public risk management. Similar uh, cases, the building code, right? Building code is, our stand, is, a, is a, a series of standards that, uh, uh, that are being applied and developed by government. So how could, or 
uh, yeah, cyber insurance lead to, to improving cyber security. So first, when we look at gray literature, and even, I mean, insurers themselves, uh, cyber insurers, I mean, uh, reinsurers, uh, uh, no, um, credit rating agencies, they all admit that there's limited knowledge uh, about cyber risk in the, um, the world of insurance. Uh, they are not able to quantify and modelize cyber risk. They admit it. They admit that they're trying to use uh, hurricanes, uh, hurricane risk modelization, and that it doesn't work. Uh, secondly, um, they suggest that the conditions attached to cyber insurance coverage would lead to a greater standardization of, of IT and, and, and cybersecurity within organization. And so, I'll come back on this, but uh, ironically, it means that cyber insurance could actually amplify uh, IT and, 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 and technology monoculture within organization, right? Thirdly, and this is very important, um, cyber insurance coverage is very customizable, is often ambiguous in terms of term, term and conditions, it's uh, implicit too, and there's lack of legal precedence. So in other words, insurers don't really know what they cover within their own coverage. Good example of this that, that is being discussed, I mean, uh, by uh, basically all stakeholders uh, in, the, from, in the, this market is the issue of silent coverage. So cyber as a peril, as a single risk being packaged within policies um, is actually hard to define, is actually sometimes not defined at all. Um, for instance, how in a, uh, I don't know, 10 page uh, insurance policy can you define what is a computer, right? Or what is a network? And so insurers within their own definitions of what is being covered and not covered do not even know what they're covering. Um, another example of this is um, the kind of gray area between cyber and terrorism. And so, of course, a cyber attack from a uh, foreign state could be deemed as an act of war by government. At that point, uh, it is the, uh, for instance, in the US, uh, the uh, terrorism insurance, uh, governmental terrorism insurance program that would kick in, and the cyber insurance uh, policies would be kind of discarded, right? And But this is still, uh, of course, due to the lack of uh, legal antecedents, um, being uh, figured, figured out. And so what we get is coverage and exposure uncertainty. Insurers are not sure what would be the impact of specific cyber events within their own portfolio, right? And one issue with this is that they, they have a hard time figuring out their uh, risk aggregation management protocols and so how a cyber catastrophe uh, would impact their, their portfolio and, and even the industry. And so I suggest that one way to think about it is to, 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 to look at cyber catastrophes as a new type of insured catastrophe risk. It's something totally new for the insurance industry. I won't go into detail, uh, into details here, but the main point is that in traditional insurance, the, the covered risks are not connected. They are independent, right? That's why you could, you can statistically pull them, right? So for instance, uh, this person dying will 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 uh, will will uh, lead to a claim of a life insurance policy will not affect the neighbor's car insurance policy, right? Whereas in the case of environmental catastrophes, um, risks are spatially or physically interconnected. So when uh, huge hurricanes occur, um, insurers have to deal with what they call risk accumulation meaning that one event, geographically located, leads to claims of, uh, of different branch of, or lines of insurance, so like car, um, sometimes life insurance, business insurance, uh, home insurance, etc. 
But in the digital world, physics do not apply. And the interconnectedness of cyber risks are a different ball game that insurers have never had to deal with. And so I suggest to understand um, the interconnectedness and the specific, the new uh, interconnectedness of cyber risks uh, from the perspective of insurers as digital and global interconnectedness. One event can lead to claims in one geographical area and throughout another, in one organization, across to other organization, in one industry, across to other industries. So um, there's a distinctive feature of cyber risks from the perspective of cyber insurers that creates a lot of problem and perhaps the most important one that you can see in the last row down there is the fact that cyber catastrophes have huge systemic potential. And so why is it the case? As you know, there hasn't been yet uh, a true uh, systemic uh, cyber catastrophe. We can think about uh, NotPedia with some major losses and quite major insured losses. Um, WannaCry is, is interesting um, because despite the fact that there's been low insured loss following WannaCry, uh, I mean, a huge number of firms in a huge number of countries have been affected. So we see here kind of the systemic potential uh, being, uh, being uh, observable. And also, if, if I come back to the, my, my table here, in terms of temporality, it's, it's, it's not a big deal to deal with. I mean, again, life insurance, this person dies at 79, and that was predictable. It's not a big deal to deal with a hurricane that will lead to that many, uh, to this major flood, that many car and home insurance claims, right? But cyber risks are evolving, dynamic, and they can also show their full consequences uh, in a diffuse uh, temporality, right? So number of years after the event, some computers, some systems, some network can, could still f uh, be uh, found as being infected or, or attacked. And I mean, this would be cause of nightmares for insurers, right? Because they would have to reopen uh, some claims, reopen some legal cases and litigation. So I think that temporality here is, is very important. And so what do uh, uh, insiders say? For instance, Dennis Kessler, CEO of Score C, so a major uh, European reinsurer, suggests that costs from uh, cyber will dwarf those from uh, environmental disasters. Even Stephen Caitlin, former head of the largest uh, Lloyd's uh, cyber underwriting uh, syndicate, suggested that cyber is the, most, uh, the biggest, most systemic risk. When you look at um, great literature, reports from credit rating agencies, uh, cyber uh, analytics, etc., two major worst case scenario, you won't be surprised, uh, are being discussed, um, I would say, uh, most often than nothing. So, a coordinated uh, state sponsored or terrorist cyber attack, some numbers from Lloyd's and the uh, the uh, Center for Risk Research at the University of Cambridge suggests suggest that such a cyber attack could lead to uh, up to $1 trillion in losses and to uh, up to $71 billion in insured losses. So again, this idea that cyber catastrophes that we haven't seen yet could be systemic because they would lead to global cascading effects, right? And secondly, an attack or outage of a cloud-based provider, I mean, a lot of people are very worried with this in, in the insurance, uh, uh, cyber insurance sector. Losses slightly lower, I mean, quite lower than uh, the, the terrorist attack, uh, but still this kind of interconnected uh, potential. We can only think about Capital One uh, and, and Amazon Web Services, of course, not a catastrophic uh, and systemic cyber events, but still, we see here the kind of coverage and, and, and things that are happening. So uh, you can see coverage of 400 million, deductible of 10 million, 
AIG as the primary insurer, and then the kind of the coverage included excess layers that were like distributed um, uh, uh, to, to different insurers, more than 15 actually. And so, what is with the cloud computing in terms of creating this new catastrophic risk for cyber insurers and for the insurance industry as a whole, and perhaps for the financial system as a well. whole? First issue, oligopolistic tendency, right? We know that in this private insurance sector, things are quite concentrated. We see that in the cloud computing sector, I mean, market is very concentrated, right? And as you know, things are just beginning, right? And so 64% uh, uh, growth uh, in 2018 for Amazon Web Services, this is huge. And, and so think about it. Let's, let's put ourselves in the shoes of, of insurers. They see this, they know this is only the beginning, but they are still having to, to, to manage stuff. So very problematic. So in conclusion, um, I suggest that cyber insurance, as it stands, might actually lead to greater uncertainty, not to more cybersecurity. First, there's what we call the irony of insurance. Private insurance often claim to be uh, a technology that will lead to our service, that will lead to, to greater uh, efficiency in terms of risk management, in terms of uh, risk reduction. But what we see in the case of cyber risks uh, is actually that IT and technological standardization could amplify the risk. Why? Due to the fact that insurers will uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, pr provide in, within conditions businesses with some, uh, some protocols, some software that they have to put in place in order to get uh, coverage. Secondly, as things stand uh, today, we can easily doubt that private insurers have good in house cybersecurity expertise. So they outsource stuff, right? A very, very big issue too. And what, what will be their incentive to, to create in-house expertise, right? Uh, so yeah. Secondly, insurers are themselves cyber risks, right? Remember Antem and Primera Blue Cross in 2015. And so insurers, in, in, private insurance is a data intensive business. I don't think I am, uh, you're learning anything here. Um, and so it's interesting to, to think about a, a tool to, to, to increase personal privacy and data security that is actually based on, I mean, the violation of privacy and on the surveillance of insured, right? Um, yeah, I could talk about this for 45 hours. But, um, and thirdly here, insurance market are based on data sharing. Right? So in the US, you got the first uh, partial antitrust exemption uh, in terms of data sharing for the insurance industry in 1945. Um, the financial sector in the US also have its own uh, data sharing uh, arrangement uh, in, in terms of uh, yeah, fi all financial actors starting in 1999. Things were happening before anyway. But also, uh, especially since uh, September 2001, um, uh, the U.S. government has put in place implicit um, policies to promote and to standardize and to yeah to promote um, the uh, sharing of uh, data between the private insurance industry and government. So here we see that again, insurers are themselves a source of cyber risk. So the way I think about all of this is that cyber insurance is in the middle of an oligopolistic nexus, right? The more cyber insurance market will expand, the more things like cloud computing will be implemented and will expand, the more um, will uh, private insurers, banks, uh, software networks provider will become interconnected. And so, 
the argument here is a kind of a is a kind of not a predictive one, but all things being equal, if what we see uh, today uh, only um, accelerates, there's here a big source of systemic risk. Also, big issue, cyber insurance risk transfer uh, is not uh, has not still uh, been developed. For instance, um, insurers and stakeholders uh, admit that there's insufficient reinsurance capacity, right? Reinsurance being the uh, insurers, uh, insurers. And so it's hard for, for cyber insurance to, to financially transfer some of their risk within uh, the reinsurance market, but also within capital markets. Stuff like uh, insurance linked securities. So these kind of securitized um, uh, asset that, 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 that insurers can invest in are just emerging. So again, low capacity to financially transfer risk to someone else. Um, and again, I don't think that either reinsurance nor capital markets will provide any more incentive to improve cybersecurity, right? Uh, I mean, these are uh, speculative markets that are functioning and that their whole purpose is to securitize risk, right? And we know where this uh, leads sometimes uh, in the case of AIG in 2007-2008. So we end up with a situation where people like Swiss Re CEO, major uh, you know, European reinsurer, suggests not, uh, I mean, it was last year that or two years ago that cyber is probably not insurable. But, I mean, <laughs> it's funny, right? How can these people as I and as powerful they can be in this market, say things like that, but still do business. So one reason is when you're in an industry, a financial industry, and you see that, as Stephen Caitlin, uh, formerly from Lloyd's, suggests that uh, their balance sheets are not large enough to pay for, for these types of catastrophic cyber events, you are well, I mean, aware that you need people to take care of things when, I mean, things go bad. And so, you, we, I think it's very important to understand that the private insurance market, all of them relies on some form of public risk management, right? The, the, the costly slash dirty job that the insurers do not or cannot do, right? So, um, in, in the case of uh, cyber insurance, first, uh, capital reserve regulations have not been put in place in the U.S., so no capital reserve regulation for cyber in the U.S., no public backstop, kind of government as the last, as the insurer in, of last resort, uh, as we see in the case of uh, terrorism insurance, so no, no such like industry safety net has been put in place. What that, what does that mean? It means that. At following a cyber catastrophe, government would have, would have to put in place ad hoc measure to save the market, right? There's no worst case scenario, political mechanism that has been put in place in terms of cyber uh, insurance. So yeah, the state is the ultimate risk manager. And um, again, I think the importance of data sharing agreements and also of what I call the cyber security state apparatus are, uh, I mean, not discussed enough in the uh, literature I've had a look at. Um, I mean, if you look at the recent history, I think I started in, perhaps in 2001, all the different branches of the US government that have put in place cybersecurity initiative is amazing. You look at the, uh, the armed forces, the Department of Treasury, name it, it's, it's, it's a complex apparatus that is being uh, developed and again, we can doubt uh, the efficiency of this kind of complex, uncoordinated kind of uh, governmental response to cyber security and cyber risks. So again, no surprises that people like Warren Buffett declared last year, I don't think we or anybody else really knows what we're doing when writing cyber insurance. Thank you very much. <laughs>